Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, I would like to address a subject that I think affects everyone, not only in these United States, but throughout the world. The problems that seem to continue and have no solution in sight, although temporary stopgaps at times seems to be a panacea, but we're right back where we've been for many thousands of years. Problems. I'd like to quote a verse from Deuteronomy, chapter 30, in which it says, this is the last day of Moses' presence in this terrestrial, on the earthly state. And he repeats the words of God that within this world, I have given you life, goodness, and then death and evil. While the idea of death and evil seems to be very familiar, I think for the most part, and certainly in our day, the world sees very little of life and at the same time goodness. Then there is another aspect in the Torah in which it says, in Deuteronomy again, that I give before you life and that you choose life if you prefer in order to live. And of course all of the commentators uh, make a, a great ado concerning this verse because someone who chooses life is already a life that we live. And the verse seems to be redundant. I present before you life so that you shall live. But what becomes obvious from this phrase in Deuteronomy is that certainly someone who's been confined to a wheelchair, someone who's living under various technological medical advances to keep and sustain his life, one cannot truly consider that as living. While life, while life is sustained, can one truly say that that is called living? Consequently, when the verse here indicates life and goodness, the other verse that I quoted previously, that we can choose a life but that is full with an abundance of goodness. That aspect, unfortunately, seems to come to very few people during their lifetime. The idea of a salvation, whether we refer to that salvation as the Messiah, and there are many people who have given up hope and assume that what is left in the way of salvation is that one day, hopefully soon, in all religions incidentally, that one day, hopefully soon, someone will appear, the Messiah, will make his entrance, and then the problems of the world will come to an end. Many of us are under that illusion. Some of us who may not necessarily believe in Messiah, 
but in our own peculiar ways. We're looking elsewhere for the Messiah, whether it be government, more government spending, whether it be medical science, that hopefully will bring to an end the plagues of illness that have overtaken rampantly the entire world, the entire world. And we're all hoping and praying that somewhere out there, some pharmaceutical company will come up with some of the remedies necessary to put an end to plagues of illness. This is the consciousness of people, all people, that have come down through the centuries. And maybe rightfully so. Because do we believe, do we personally believe that we, each and every single individual, believes that he can put an end to plagues of illness, cancer, which the medical society has already ad admitted, that with all of its advances, with all of its advances, they are losing ground each and every single year. Government to provide all of the services necessary. And yet, every thinking individual understands, no matter what politicians have to say, and I'm not here to deride any political figure or political movement, but no matter what these political movements would like us to believe, and that is they have come forward with a particular solution to the ills of society. We hope and pray that maybe they have found the answers. Although, based on the track record of political movements, if anything, they have constantly led all peoples of the world into one form of chaos or another. But this is the thinking. This is the consciousness of peoples all around the world. The demonstrations against government merely indicate that government should be doing more for us. But government can't do more than is feasibly possible, humanly possible. And yet, for whatever reason, our consciousness remains stuck in the mud with the idea that someone out there has the solution. That some movement is going to come up with the remedy that will provide the utopia that we all long for. I'm not even going into the matter of crime and violence. Hollywood does a good job at that because that is what we, we look forward in our personal lives, day in and day out. The fear of crime and violence is something that does not permit tranquility or serenity within our lives. As much as we plan to run from these conditions, somehow they seem to follow us wherever we run or wherever we go to. I would also like to touch on one other subject. The question of the Messiah. Question of the Messiah. Meaning and the implication that Messiah means that one solution whereby all of humanity, all of humanity, will finally have arrived at what they consider to be a useful, productive, and tranquil life. I would like to quote from the Zohar concerning that period. When I say that period, 
I should rather correct and say our period. Because we, we now exist, we now live within that age of Aquarius, the age of Mashiach. It is not something now in the distant future as it was two and three thousand years ago. And the Zohar states that the Messiah, speaking about the Messiah, Bismanahu Yitore Melacha Mashiach Latset Min Ganed. Whoever this King Messiah is will emerge from a consciousness which is known as Ganed, paradise. Knowing from a Kabbalistic interpretation of Ganeden, it means that realm of existence where chaos, where chaos, devastation does not exist. He will leave that domain, says the Zohar, and he will be revealed in the Galilee in Israel. And it is on the basis of this Zohar, as you know, the Christian religion emerged because that is where their Messiah, their supposedly Messiah, who would bring peace on earth and goodwill towards our fellow men, would emerge. And he did emerge from there. But with his, his entrance into the world, our familiar world did not and was not accompanied with tranquility, serenity, and peace. On this basis, says the Zohar, Biyomahu Shahamashiach Yetzel Lesham, because he is leaving. He is now descending into another consciousness, the consciousness that you and I find ourselves, the consciousness that all around us there is havoc, all around us there's chaos. Yitragez kol haolam, vechol bnei haolam yitkabu betoch meyera. When he makes his appearance, says the Zohar, the people shall be fearful. They will all hide because of his appearance. And they will have no inkling nor desire to think that they they shall be saved from the Messiah. The reason I read this to you is what the Zohar is referring to is man's consciousness today. The consciousness that someone will come and all problems come to an end. Says the Zohar, no. On the contrary, with the emergence of the Zohar, of the Mashiach, what will impress every single person is with the realization that no one out there, and I say without exception, is going to be our salvation. The Torah makes it very clear when it says, you shall choose life. Meaning, in the final analysis, the responsibility to achieve a life of serenity without chaos, without devastation, without fear and violence will only depend upon the individual and only upon his decisions and consciousness. There is no one but right now, we still live with that hope and prayer that somewhere out there lies the solution. Says the Zohar, unfortunately, this distorted consciousness, which has in effect not brought the kind of end to chaos that we all had expected with each fall of a dictator, with each change of government, with each new promise of a better world to come, we have never as yet found the fruits of the slogans of these various people or movements, including the love movement 
of 1960 all but completely vanished. Love. How many of us hear about that word today? How many are even familiar with that word? What does it mean? Love. Two people getting married. As I've written in my book on reincarnation. Two people. Who are so madly in love with each other. And I've said the best way to kill a romance is to do what? Get married. Unfortunately. Where does all this love disappear? That supposedly exists. What about families? Father and children. Parents. Brother and sister. Love. Blood relationship. Do we always find the kind of love, the understanding of love as we believe it should be, truly existing in our lives? Isn't it something of a, in our imagination that we believe that is possible? It is also possible that we believe that what we construe as to meaning as love really does not exist. The moments of hate within families, within businesses, amongst nations, vanishes one time or another. Says the Zohar, because we do not understand that all of these beautiful concepts no matter what they relate to, are concepts that we seek from without us. And as long as there cannot be a change in our own consciousness, meaning that no one, no one outside of ourselves can bring us to all the fulfillments of our dreams, it is only ourselves. And therefore, when the Torah says, choose life so that you shall live, the Torah didn't say the leaders of Israel, Moses, and all of the subsequent prophets would bring that period and that state of affairs to where we would all be comfortable, happy with each other. There are no promises of that nature in the Torah. The reason is because the Torah has provided us with an insight as to what is going to produce individual happiness. And that is individual responsibility. President Clinton touched upon it, but so slightly. Saying we'll all have to sacrifice. And what was his... What was his definition of sacrifice? We'll all have to take out a few more dollars to support the deficit. But is that our only problem? Did he address himself to all of the other problems like crime, violence, illness, etc.? No. And not because he has no intention not to address these very difficult problems, but he has no solutions. And he has never pretended that he does. Where does that leave you and I? From a Kabbalistic point of view, we have no choice. Whether you can afford the luxury, I say the luxury, of assuming that the Kabbalistic method the Kabbalistic approach to the resolution of all of mankind's ills lies with the individual. And if you can afford that luxury, not to accept it, but go on with your consciousness that someone out there will come up with the idea, by all means, 
No coercion in spirituality is the old Kabbalistic dogma. Everyone has a right and freedom to choose as they please, like it says in the Torah. No one can tell you what is good or what is bad for you. Each individual must try it. But in the absence of any other approach, with the idea that because the people have not been ready, have not accepted the idea of personal responsibility, says the Zohar, then the coming of Messiah will be worse than death. Because that outside salvation, and he wasn't referring to an individual, he is referring to the promises of government, the promises of the medical establishment, that they, in the very near future, will resolve our problems. They will only compound, increase the problems that lie ahead, says the Zohar. Because with each affirmation, our consciousness is reduced as to our responsibility. We're all ready to hear what everyone has to say concerning our welfare. I hear very little as to the individual's concern as to what he is expected in return to warrant, to merit the fulfillment of his dreams. We're leaving it everybody else. We can go on and do as we please. Says the Zohar. That kind of thinking will disappear in the age of Aquarius, and that's what's going for us. The idea that when the Torah said that you and I can choose life for ourselves, it meant exactly that. You and I are the only ones that can choose, that can choose to follow the path of certainty or choose the path of darkness and uncertainty. In our lives, in our personal lives, each and every single day, there are decisions that have to be made every single day. Unfortunately, The path that most of us take is one of, this is what I think. And then again, unfortunately, our brain, our intelligence, somehow is not and does not remedy the problems that we face each and every single day. And says the Zohar, do you know why? Because there is no handbook available for most people. You have a problem today. What decision is there to be made? What path should we choose? Right or left? Yes or no? Is there something that we can resort to? Find the answer for each and every single day of living? Unfortunately. Most people believe a book of that nature does not exist. But the Bible, the Torah, is that instrument. But you might add, ask, the Bible speaks of so many things which are far, so far remote from our daily existence. We don't have oxen today. We don't have many of the aspects that the Torah deals with. Of what relevance is 90% of the Torah in our personal lives? The answer is, if you read the Torah as it is read, 90%, 90%, 
does not apply, has truly no relevance. But if I can share with you an illustration which I think will make the point clear, and that is this Torah, this Bible that was revealed on Mount Sinai, is like an unlit highway in the evening. When you travel down this highway, and if for whatever reason the headlights of your automobile do not function, you can pass all the directions down that highway and you'll never reach your destination. Although the signs are there, but you need something, a flashlight, a headlight to illuminate the path. It is that simple. So too says the Zohar in its interpretation of the Bible. The Bible for all those who read it superficially do not understand that it is a coded, completely abstruse compendium of all of our experiences. Our experiences. Not the experiences of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not the experiences of the Jews leaving Egypt from bondage. But each and every single verse refers to our own individual lives. But one might ask, that is not the way it seems to be written. And says the Zohar, and says the Zohar, the Bible is like the human body. The human body is a living organism. Living organism. But does it make decisions? Are things clear if you look at an individual, just looking at him? If he's handsome, would you say he must be honest? If he's ugly looking, would you have to conclude that he must be a thief? And yet, the body is our expression, but it is only an expression. It is unclear when you observe the body. However, the internal intelligence and conscience of the individual, that kind of makes the body manifest the internal thoughts that are within the individual, and this body is the method by which my thoughts are expressed. So too is the Bible. When you read it, it has no meaning. But if you can illuminate that, bo that, that body, if you can illuminate it, whether one is ugly or, or handsome, the idea that if words of wisdom become manifest from this individual, then it's the words of wisdom manifested by the physical body. True. Is what clears the, the way, is what makes and illuminates the path of our life. That is Kabbalah. That, as a practitioner, as a practitioner of the rules of Kabbalah, each and every single person is in a position to illuminate his path. The reason why we do not understand why we are in indecision is not because the decisions are not there. Not because we, have, we haven't the access into the information. As a simple example, when we're asked to recall a name of, of somebody we met a few days ago, and suddenly there's a blank mind, blank mind. Does it mean the mind is blank? Does it mean that information is not contained? 
must be there because a few moments later or a day or two later, I recall what the Zohar says, all of the information, I say all of the information that you and I need for decisions in each and every single day of our lives is already there. In fact, there's no room for indecision. In fact, tomorrow, you won't have to resort to the idea, how could I have done something as stupid as that? Suddenly, a day or two later, we have revelation. We understand the mistakes we made. Unfortunately, for the most part, those mistakes cannot be corrected. But if we can come to an understanding as to what the Zohar is trying to present is an idea that for you and I, each and every single step, the step that we can choose for life, that will be full and abundant of the things and aspirations that we desire. They're all there, says the Zohar. They're just waiting for you to pick them up. What is missing is that flashlight in the brain, if I can use that metaphor. The signs are there, but they're unrevealed, says the Zohar. If you have a major decision to make, and you can't seem to come to any conclusion. The answers are there. The answers as to how to maintain one's health. And it's not always with jogging or maintaining a well-balanced diet. We're resorting to these different items as in the absence of nothing else, maybe. But we know people who do not adhere to strict diets. We know people who jog religiously drop dead overnight. And then there are those who never jog. There are those who smoke two, three packs a day. Must they die at age 40 and 50? Goldie Mayer lived to 89. Smoked three packs of cigarettes every single day. Is that what has been determined? as creating a life of living. Not smoking does not necessarily mean your life is fulfilled. Keeping a well-balanced diet or exercising does not mean now that your life is free of stress. But yet, we become obsessed with these ideas, thinking, thinking that maybe these are some of the solutions that are necessary. The solutions to our problems. The solutions. The information on how chaos in our own personal lives, in our own personal lives, can be avoided. The information is already contained in this thing that is called mind. All of it. Only one problem. Only one problem. That problem is the sign. Which road to take, right or left? What to do? What not to do? So as to ensure our personal, physical, and mental well being. That flashlight, that illumination is the only aspect that needs to be cleared up. Life is not as difficult, nor is it as complicated as we have been led to believe. But take a look around. Crime and violence. One needs to fear walking in the streets at night. Everyone? Is everyone going to be mugged? Is everyone going to meet up with misfortune? 
Then we have another excuse that we rely upon. Sometimes you're lucky, and sometimes you're unlucky. Again, leading us into that one, what I call, satanic consciousness. You have no control. You, as an individual, have no possibility to achieve certainty in your life. You, as an individual, have been told that once you pass the age of 20, what happens? The body degenerates. That's the rule. Don't you know? It's the rule. And with that rule, and the rule is not wrong, because most people do come into degeneration of their physical body. Oh, there are those who don't. It's going to be one million people by the year 2000, over the age of 100. I can't imagine what their secret must be. They don't seem to conform to the rules of degeneration. And I have to tell you, three years ago, I had gone to a health farm, and for the first time, for the first time in my life, I met up with an individual who was over 100 years. If I had seen the greatest miracle come out of heaven, I would not have been as astonished as the idea that there is someone over 100 years. How could that be? The body degenerates after age 20. We all know that. Well, if you live until 60, 70, even 80, a ripe old age. Who says that the body must degenerate? Because we haven't learned how to illuminate this mind, the mind that includes what God had originally intended it to be. Full of goodness. But if you care to choose the other road, and because of free will in this universe, you have the option to choose one of chaos. We know there are many people, many people, who prefer to be invalids, ill, sick, so they can evoke sympathy. All over the world. For the most part, in our personal lives, if we're having difficulties with our wives or husbands, if we can evoke a little sympathy, you know, you can end a, a quarrel right then and there. Oh, oh, have you ever seen that one? See, those are the answers. Those are the answers that we apply in business. Those are the answers that many people in a situation where it's, there is impending chaos, they will resort to any solution. Are those items the solution? Says the Zohar, we have within our own particular brain, within our own consciousness, the answers, but not answers on a very general way, but answers that apply to each and every single day of our existence. Because we can choose an existence, says the Zohar and the Torah, but one full of life. Well, who wouldn't want to choose a life full of living? But it is clear from the Bible that to choose life does not depend upon you. But this is an enormous job that I feel the center has to create a revolution in the way we think. A revolution that we ourselves are in a position 
to change history, to change the course of destiny. I always like to use the example of a dark room. Someone comes in, looking for the switch, can't find it. The room stays dark, doesn't it? Because he can't find the switch. Is the room dark? Yeah, proof of it is. He can't find the switch. If there was a little light on, he would even be able to find the switch that can put all the lights on. But then what happens when he puts all the lights on? Somehow the darkness disappears. Did you ever ask yourself the question, where is that darkness that was there before? Where is it? You drive someone out of your home, you know he's now on the outside, he's somewhere else. If darkness is more than an illusion, if indecision, which is darkness, if taking the path that leads you down the road of illness is darkness because you can't find the right road, isn't that the same idea? Where does it go away? The obvious answer is darkness in a room or an auditorium must of necessity be an illusion. Because if it's an entity, then where did it go after you flip the switch and the lights go on? Been a, been a, been a phenomena that I have been troubled with. Where did it go? But we don't even begin to ask of ourselves the question, where did it go? We take for granted. We take for granted that flipping of the switch will remove all forms of darkness. We understand. But unfortunately, that is the extent to which that illustration, that metaphor, takes us. But if we just added another dimension to that question, where did it go? Not that when you flip a switch, it disappears. Where did it go? Ask yourself that question time and time again. You can only come to one conclusion. That darkness was an illusion. It never existed. An individual who's in one room and disappears into another room, you know, or if I don't even know where he disappeared to, I know that he's somewhere. Do you think that darkness has taking a passage somehow out to another room? No, of course not. But where did it go? Where did it go? And the answer is, and I see the smiles on your face, of course it just disappears. Well, only something of an illusionary nature can disappear. Even atoms, when you cook water, we know that there is no disappearance in the water. It's either condensation or somewhere else, and it's turned back into molecules, and etc. But it didn't disappear. Where did darkness go? I just ask, darkness, where did it go to? Why, don't, why, why can't we touch it, feel it? Because it is illusionary. And that is what the Zohar considers the entire realm of chaos and devastation. Well, that already... Is it not a matter? After all, after age 20, it's a fact that health disappears for the most part, right? We accept that. It disappears. Where does it disappear to? Where does it disappear to? And there are many whose lives do not operate on that principle. And live until 120. And we're being told that as we move into this age of Aquarius, centurions that will be over a million in just a few short years, 10 years hence, there will be 10 million. They will begin to compound. Isn't that enough of a realization to make us think that maybe the rules that we are familiar with, the rules that we have accepted without thinking may be illusionary. The Zohar says yes. He learns that from the verse. You can choose a life of living. How? 
got to flip the switch. You've got to flip the switch. Now we come to the question, where is that switch? Where is the switch? The switch. All of the switches are contained in the Bible. All and every, when I say all, I mean every single word and verse is a switch. The interpretation of how each particular verse deals with a particular switch, whether it be business, whether it be health, whether it be social relationships, and no matter how compounded the problems may be, if you can just access into the switch, just permit a little light to enter, a little light, like in a very large, darkened auditorium, little light. It may not illuminate the entire auditorium, but at least you can begin to walk in that auditorium, not think you'll trip over something. It may not be as comfortable if it was totally illuminated, true? But it's a good beginning. What is necessary to change, to change and regain control over the madness that has overtaken this entire globe, not only the United States and not only Canada and not only Mexico, but the entire globe is headed for total chaos. You don't have to be an economist, a philosopher, or a politician to know that. Read, and you have enough information to understand that if hope is coming from out there, forget it. Forget it. Yes, this is where suddenly most of us choose the illusionary path to reality. We would like to believe what is not going to happen. We do fall into the traps of illusion just as we do not understand the darkness in a room that it's illusionary. It's illusionary. It's only illusionary because we know that it didn't take an exit into another room. We know it wasn't there in the first place because if it had been an entity and when that flip of the switch takes place, where did it go? And our only conclusion must be that it wasn't there in the first place. The indecisions, the paths that leaves us, leads us into illness, disruption in social relationships, uncertainties of relationships. These, these indecisions are all illusionary, says the Zohar. Are all illusionary. But, but, how do I remove that illusionary darkness? By turning the light on. How do you turn the light on? You make use of the Bible. On the wall there, obviously you see a concoction of words that have no meaning whatsoever. But each and every single box there is a switch that opens up not only a little flashlight, but provides enough light to illuminate the entire world. Because for control, for control, in this quantum age meaning, that if there is a nuclear explosion in Chernobyl, you and I have been affected to whatever degree that means every single human and vegetable in this universe is affected by the harmful, the harmful, sometimes decaying follow-ups of this explosion. You can't run away from it. How do you protect yourself from that? Can you still choose a life of living when all around us the world crumbles? 
So even if I could hide, in this day and age, that isn't even an outlet that we can pursue. Therefore, when we illuminate, when we create a little light, that light, from a Kabbalistic point of view, using any of those, using any of those particular little boxes, and there are 72 of them, you illuminate not only the immediate brain in your mind as to decisions, but that illumination, unlike a match that maybe can only light up a part of the auditorium, a part of a dark astrodome. But those, those little devices create an abundance of light that lights up that entire astrodome. The power of Kabbalah. It is a power that has been again restored to its rightful ownership. The ownership the ownership of these buttons belongs to the individual. Only 20 years ago, this was not available. We would all have to depend on lucky and being unlucky without, for a moment, having the option to choose another path. In the Torah, there are a few demonstrations. There are a few demonstrations of what has become known as natural disasters. After all, a natural disaster is something which is beyond the control of the human being. Because if you read your insurance policy, do you know what it says? An act of God. Now, who are you and I to face up to the decision of God to, heaven forbid, have Las Vegas, now the seashore on the Pacific Ocean? Act of God. I was wondering, why are we still living in California? Since they, the doomsayers continue to repeat the idea of the big one. Why do we still hang out here? I mean, there is nothing more precious than our lives. Why do people still hang out here? Only to indicate where our consciousness is. There are some people who have left California, or more specifically Los Angeles, because they're worried. But for the most part, people remain here. Whether it be for economic conditions, family, or whatever. But is there anything more valuable than one's own life? How do we, how do we reconcile the idea that the Big Bang will be coming, so they say, and, of course, they also admit that this would be an act of God. And consequently, I haven't read lately in the newspapers as to how to prevent earthquakes. There's no solution on that one. But then again, that's an act of God. From a Kabbalistic point of view, and I find this very difficult, when I lecture on this particular point, to convince people that there is a possibility that we retain some control in this universe. That we can prevent earthquakes. That idea that we can prevent earthquakes, to me, to me, is symbolic of the individual. Symbolic of the individual who prefer, prefers to live in chaos so he can demand sympathy and whatever other benefits can accrue from his living in that condition. For whatever good reasons, 
he refuses to accept the idea that he can pull himself up and take himself out of that condition. No, some people prefer it. I find it very difficult to convey an idea which is not mine, but the idea of the Bible itself that it, there is no such thing as an act of God. Does that mean we have to rewrite all the insurance policies? But even an act of God can only be an act of certainty, structure, without chaos. But we have all assumed because we believe we have no control, we therefore all assume that God up there must delight in the pain and suffering of his creatures. Hurricanes, tidal waves, cancer, you name it, AIDS. The list goes on and on. Acts of God. And to more or less of an extent, we have all accepted that principle. If we are religious, whatever religion, we accept this as an atonement. And so God punishes us. In his mysterious ways, he creates the misery and suffering in our lives. But more importantly, the reason why that misconception arose, the conception that God, in his mysterious ways, wishes to purify us, wishes us to pay and atone for our sins, by and within that concept, exists the idea that we have no control. That life is just one bundle of problems of which we again must resort to an idea of either being lucky or unlucky. Again, relinquishing control over our lives. When you make the statement or satisfy your conscience by stating, there but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God go I. Nothing to do with us. All up in the hands of God. But I do not subscribe, as the Zohar does not subscribe to an evil God. That evil must originate elsewhere. And the Zohar tells us where it does. Negative activity. Negative consciousness on behalf of the individual. But an individual who thinks right, who thinks right, will have less of suffering and chaos in his life. Does that mean that all peoples, all peoples, who are kind, generous, do not fall prey and victim to chaos, says the Zohar. Yes, they can also fall prey to victim and be victims of chaos. Why? Because the individual who is kind has a sharing consciousness is full of positive activities. He, within his own environment, he, within his own life, can generate the positive energy of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God, the fulfillment of God, however states the Zohar. If that kind individual has this kind of match that illuminates his immediate environment, 
but he's caught up in world chaos. He is now subject to the rules of the universe. That so much of negative negativity has been fisted by so many other people in this world that all of us, even those kind and generous people, are becoming and will become subject to the negative influence that now prevails over the universe. And that is why the universe is full of so much chaos. Because it is beyond, beyond the control of the individual. We learn from the Torah that we ourselves can make changes in our own lives. But when it comes to being affected by world conditions, beyond our immediate environment, we have again been given the option by God, who does not adhere to the principles of chaos and devastation, so that we, each and every single individual, will be equipped with the switches that can clear up an entire environment, including a Chernobyl for that, for that individual, strange as it may sound. Am I here this evening to convince you? Do I have to really convince you on how you can take control of your life? And I must say, I believe the moment you walk out, doubts will set in. Doubts will set in. How can I even take a chance? I mean, it's absurd. There's a long history of chaos and devastation in this world. Why would I think that I could even change it? No, that's satanic consciousness. He is so powerful. He has such a control and hold over our lives and consciousness. He doesn't even permit us a respite. A respite, maybe this hour, an hour and a half that you're present here. Well, maybe it does sound right. Maybe it sounds right, and maybe it's even a possibility. But remember, when you leave these doors, I have not indicated in any way that satanic consciousness, that force in this universe, not God, but a force known as satanic consciousness and energy intelligence that preys upon us 24 hours a day. He is the singular enemy, not Chernobyl. He has been placed in this universe, says the Zohar, to steer men away from what should be their inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. That's his function. But, says the Zohar, he is like that darkened room. You flip the switch, he disappears. He is our enemy, the enemy of our consciousness. He does not permit us to achieve a higher awareness. He does not permit an altered state of consciousness that we can control our lives. What I'm sharing with you this evening is an idea that from a Kabbalistic point of view, something which is 3,800 years old, not as long as some political party is in existence, but a teaching of 3,800 years old that states that the individual has the right, the privilege, to achieve happiness in his life. If he so chooses. If he so chooses. And that's why the Torah, the Bible, is so clear on that word. If you choose it. I choose it. Of course, I choose not to have earthquakes. My friends, no, you haven't chosen it. There isn't anyone here in Los Angeles that has a consciousness of choosing a development that will prevent earthquakes. It's an act of God. And by virtue of that consciousness, that it's an act of God, they have created that illusion of darkness 
We create the illusion of darkness. We create the, the, the idea of, a, of, a, of an earthquake. Not God. Proof of it is, and I mentioned this one instance, because this does apply, it does apply to the residents of Southern California. In chapter 16, Sorry, yes, chapter 16. We have here a situation by which there was a quarrel between Korah and Moses. And Moses is told by God, since God did know his intention, his intention, It's a long story, but you perform certain sacrifices, and the other side did what they did. And then God says, separate. The two camps should be separated. No, oh, maybe 20 feet, 15 feet. Because these people, Korah, with their evil inclination, will create, we'll create an earthquake and they will be swallowed up. They will be swallowed up. But it just, maybe it was only five feet away. In fact, it may have only been one foot. But there was a clear demarcation between the two camps. Korah has swallowed up. The others are not. The others are not. How could an earthquake be so precise? Well, maybe God is so precise. But we haven't found the nature of earthquakes to separate one side of the street from the other. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it may. But, says the Zohar, from this chapter on the subject of earthquakes, we learn that there are no such thing, things as natural acts of God, but rather the negative activity of man, his negative consciousness, his negative way of thinking creates chaos in our midst. And by the same token, this chaos, devastation, that may come upon a certain society. Those who know, who can press the right buttons at the right time, can avoid the impact of devastation. Because we have been given that option. We have been given that option on how to prevent cancer. It's taught in the classes. It's no secret. We have been given many options that we have already programmed our consciousness into the realization that we are at the mercy of something. And then if we're lucky or unlucky, so be it. But we have moved in to the age of Aquarius. And there are people, tens of thousands, that have begun to revolutionize their own consciousness into the belief that maybe, maybe by chance, there is the option of taking control of our own lives. Thank you.
you're saying it may have disappeared into the light. Shouldn't there be some residue of what existed before? I, I, we see it on a physical level, and darkness is something very physical, because we're guided by that idea. We're afraid to move in a dark room. Uh, why shouldn't there be some remain of, of that? If, that's, if it's not illusionary, I guess you're trying to make the point that it's not illusionary. If it's illusion, then it never existed there in the first place. That is the interpretation or understanding of illusion. Can I read from a book that is based on 3,800 years old, long before Judaism was even a religion? You know when Judaism began as a religion? You know when, don't you? What's that? Moses Sinai. There was no Jewish religion, so to speak. It was presented on Mount Sinai. So I'm going back to Abraham. That's why I, I just wanted to make it clear as to when Judaism started, right? I can only read what it says. My interpretation has no validity, nor am I extending an interpretation. And I want to repeat those words again so you hear it clearly. And that day, and I'm reading on page 34 of the Zohar, volume 7. Okay? Page 34 in the section of Shemot. That he will make his appearance. You know what the Rogiz means if there are some Israelis here? What does that mean? What? Upset, anger. <coughs> that will be the result of his appearance. That's what it says. So whether this conforms with what you consider to be traditional Judaism, and of course Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai has never been denied his rightful place in traditional Judaism. So I might be denied that place, but he certainly wasn't. And that's what he says. what he says. He's going to stir us all up. That's what he's going to do. And as I continue, Does anyone here know Hebrew a little to translate that? Maybe I'm, I'm applying my own translation. What does that mean? Does that sound like a wonderful period to be present? I mean, I don't know. How many caves do we have here in uh, California? What we have discussed here this evening. Messianic prophecy. Is you and me. You and I are going to bring Mashiach. If we all have this consciousness of what we have briefly discussed this evening, that is Mashiach. He will only be the forerunner as to how all of us in the world will change our consciousness. That's Mashiach. To be free from an existing consciousness, most difficult process that a human being can undergo. Change. Change. We don't even want to change our eating habits.
Yes, there, there is a very specific prayer. I use the word prayer in the absence. I, I, it really doesn't mean prayer. It means kavanot. Kavanot means direction. That you learn almost uh, in the early classes, I believe, if, if Moshe is here. Moshe, is it in the early class of the Anabakar? In the meditation. Yes. Right there at the answer. I give you the tools. That's what this lecture was about this evening. Sure. Not leaving you to just walk out and say, well, there might be now new hope. No, we're very specific about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. you, see, you see in this synagogue, you see things that you generally will not find in many other synagogues. Things that make no, not, you know, make no sense. But those are our keys. If, and I, I, I'm not saying that we can accomplish that within a day or within an hour and a half lecture, but if we can come to the realization, as the Zohar is making an attempt to describe all forms, all forms of chaos as illusionary. No, a tumor is not illusionary. Let's face it, you know, I don't have to go up into the outer, outer, outer space to, you know, find my problems. Tumor, it's a tumor. Let's face it, it's something very real. But it's something of a chaotic nature, according to the Zohar. Supported by science without going into how science supports this idea, but that our consciousness should eliminate, vaporize that tumor. Problem is, the, between the theoretical and the practical, there seems to be a little space. But theoretically, from a physicist, physicist's point of view, our consciousness should determine whether it exists or it doesn't. Their difficulty is from the theoretical to the practical. But there's got to be consciousness. And I, and I, have, to, I have to admit that no matter how long you're involved in Kabbalah, and no matter how many tools you're now operating with, new tools, if you permit satanic consciousness, which is uncertainty, you know, well, I'm doing it now, and I'm, I'm, I'm vaporizing, and I'm, I'm eliminating that tumor. Well, no, I've been working on it now three weeks. How come it's still there? There you are. You've fallen into, satanic, into the satanic trap. So I'm not saying it's something that will come easy. But we got to begin because there is no hope. And I'm not a doomsayer. Thank God I'm here to tell you that we can take control of our lives rather than say, look, one out of every three women are going to have cancer, breast cancer. What about the rest? There are other forms of cancer. One out of 100 males today have AIDS. I, you know, now what about the rest of the, the maladies that, that man com is confronted with? I mean, we're living in a, in a totally, totally ill society. And along comes the Zohar and says, you can take control. But it re will require, firstly and foremost, a total elimination of satanic uncertainty consciousness. Not easy. Not easy. <clears throat> it's a battle it's a battle that will be with us 24 hours a day. He doesn't let go. He doesn't let go. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if you're referring to satanic consciousness, are you referring to as my fortune's friends say that he's a constant temptation you know, to do bad? Is that, is that how you're um, referring to him? You know, a temptation for adultery, a temptation for stealing? Stuff like that? Or, I mean, that's he doesn't get into those particulars. Why should he be bothered with that? All he does is stop putting you into uncertainties, places where you wind up 
in the wrong place at the right time by your decisions. All of these other matters follow. You know, if, um, if an individual, see, he works out of his own home, never leaves his home, in fact, he has no reason to. He's got all the amenities, a pool, a gym room, and so on. The chances of him committing adultery very, very far removed, right? <laughs> Possible. The point I'm making is the uncertainty that we have no control. When we have come to the conclusion that satanic consciousness is correct, lucky, unlucky, and nothing, nothing, nothing is out there that I can control. When you have this, this type of consciousness, then the whole gamut of, of evil wrongdoing is open. But when you're connected to, to the light, it just illuminates, and you see right down the road that if you took this course of adultery, it winds up, and you see the movie right there in front of you. The trouble is we don't, we don't see everything. We don't see the results of our actions always. No. Passing love affair. No, but, it'll, but if he can see the whole, or she can see the whole movie right down the line. See, because the movie is there from beginning to end. Only one problem. It's a small, it's not a flip of a switch and a continuous illumination. Flip of the match, striking of the match, just lights up a part of it. And therefore, now the darkness sets in. Will it lead me really to the things that, you know, would, could create chaos and so on? As long as he can instill within us the uncertainty factor, the darkness factor. He's got us up. So that's, that's what I consider to be of prime importance. Changing our consciousness. Knowing, too, that the road is all lit up because I'm keeping my headlights on all the time. Using, using that as a metaphor. It will take two more. Yes, ma'am. Compared the, the darkness of the room to the darkness of the night, and the, the sun hasn't gone away, the light has not gone away, we're just in a different place. It's kind of like if we can consciously be on the other side of the world, we can still be the light. I can answer that question if I'd ask you just to have a little more patience and wait for my new book that's coming out, which is going to state, quoting a Zohar, sun is shining. Don't believe it. Absolutely. 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 Thank you.